for those watching, I'm Jamie Briggs, the managing partner of PwC uh, here in Adelaide. Uh, and I've got the uh, pleasure of interviewing Jim McDowell, the CEO of the Premier and Cabinet in South Australia this afternoon um, and answer some of, discuss some of the issues around COVID-19 uh, and put some of the perspectives and questions that you've been putting uh, over uh, email in the last 24, 48 hours. Um, I should start by acknowledging uh, that the land we meet today is a traditional lands for the Ghana people and we respect the, their spiritual relationship with their country. We also acknowledge the Ghana people as the traditional custodians of the Adelaide region and that their cultural and heritage beliefs are still important to li the living Ghana people today. Obviously we are in unbelievable times, um, once in a lifetime experience, we hope. Um, times we haven't seen since probably the end of the Second World War, Jim. How are you feeling? Well, I think I'm feeling um, a mixture of, uh, of, of fear and hope. And I think that's probably what many people feel because one of the reasons why this is called novel coronavirus is that it's, it's new. Mm -hmm. It's a disease that nobody's seen before, thus nobody has any, nobody has any immunity to it until until they catch it. Uh, so, so that's a very frightening thing. But then I, I look at how the community has reacted and how government has reacted at all levels, uh, but particularly how people have reacted, how people have, have decided that they're going to self-isolate, that they're going to put themselves through some significant um, hardships. Now, some of that we've had to regulate because we thought it wise, but, but I see most of it, most people behave properly, mm -hmm. particularly if they're listening to good and not in informed uh, medical advice. Which is, I think, the other thing I would say is we have based all of our decisions on the advice of the AHPPC, who are the bunch of public health professionals, both state and, and commonwealth, who have been assembled to give us advice on this matter. So we're not taking the advice of, you know, of every person or in, indeed even every doctor who believes he's an epidemiologist or who's a public health um, uh, expert. We are taking the advice of the peak group of public health officers in the country. Mm. We're all seemingly uh, experts now on the spread of pandemics uh, in the community. But the, the interesting um, aspect of this from a public sector perspective um, in my time around Australian politics and, and public public service, um, the debate around our federation has been, and it will always be, uh, the um, I think one of the major sticking points of the Australian uh, constitution and the way that we govern. A month ago, had you said to me we could you know have a national cabinet operate two or three times a week to deal with an emergency like this, it would have been hard to imagine. Um, yet in the last three weeks, you've. You've done that. You've met, I think, on average about two or three times a week, including today. How's that experience, how's that working as far as the Federation's concerned? OK, well, it was the 10th, 10th meeting today of the National Cabinet. The National Cabinet, as you say, is composed of the Prime Minister and each of the First Ministers of each state and uh, one official from each, from each jurisdiction, and I happen to be that official for South Australia. Um, there, there's a certain... There's something about the about timing that's really important and just as this was really kicking off just as we were getting, starting to get really serious about it which is only three weeks ago mm. we had a coag in Parramatta so we had all, all of the, that cast of characters together in one place well heaven forbid we should try and do that today <laughs> but we did three weeks ago and that meeting which was focused on a number of things but particularly COVID-19, I think was the real catalyst in terms of a spark mm -hmm. that allowed us to get the National Cabinet up and running. Mm -hmm. Now, I have very little experience in, in public administration because I spent most of my life in the private sector, so I have nothing to compare it to. Mm -hmm. But it is, I can only say it is surprisingly, perhaps surprisingly, productive and collegiate, but the issues are all on the table for debate. Now, maybe we, with the current Prime Minister is one who, who is rather more um, collegiate, rather more collaborative in his style than other past Prime Ministers we can maybe think of. But, and also I suspect we have a really good crop of state leaders at the mm. moment, and all of that has really helped. Mm. Um, I th and I think 
it's not an unconstitutional ground. It doesn't pretend to be anything other than it is. Mm. Uh, and um, But people have been extremely willing to sign up, each First Minister and Premier and Prime Minister, to say, if we agree something in this, we will do it, and we won't surprise each other by doing things that we haven't at least brought to and discussed at this forum. And I think that's very, very healthy. Yeah. So there's two main aspects that are playing out affecting the community and, and decisions that governments are having to make. The first is obviously the health crisis, and that's what all these actions are, are designed to reduce the impact on our health system and, and keep as many Australians alive as possible. And we've seen the consequences in Europe and, and now America if we don't manage that well. Um, interested in, the Prime Minister's given an update today around um, the spread, um, yeah. where we're at with that, how do you feel in South Australia, where we're at, what's, what's the um, expectation of the coming weeks and months? Okay, look, each state and territory is in a slightly different position for a whole load of reasons. This is a public health issue, and it's a public health issue that the market's finding hard to price as well. So you see great fluctuations in the market because it's never seen this risk, don't know how to price the risk. So um, if I look at the South Australian trajectory on a relatively limited amount of data, we've been, you know, with the first infection here on, on the Premier's birthday, as I like to remind him, on the 21st of January, and you had a couple of very, very low on ones and twos, until whatever it was about two and a half weeks ago when yeah. this, when this started to build. And we now have a bit over 400. Um, and we have a huge regime of testing. So if you look at the tests per head of the population, the country that's done most tests per head of the population is Australia. And the second highest is the Republic of Korea, mm -hmm. who have done a really good job after a poor start in Daegu particularly, where they had that religious sect that, that, that was a very, very large community outbreak. So we've managed to contain, um, to have tested a lot of people per head of the population. We have about a 1.9% confirmation rate. Mm -hmm. uh, so of 1.9% of people who are tested are positive. In the United States at the moment, that's 53%. In the United Kingdom, it's 25%. So that gives us some confidence that we started the testing early enough before there was community transmission. And therefore, the other countries that have these very high rates of return would suggest there's a lot of cases in the community that they don't yet know about that have been transmitted from the community. Mm -hmm. our, we are ramping up our contact tracing, which is the absolute sort of key um, forensic element towards tracking this down. So we had about 30 people doing contact tracing over the next two weeks. We'll ramp that up to 300 people doing contact tracing. So every person that a positive uh, has been in contact with will be traced, will be asked to go into isolation, may well be forced to go into uh, quarantine is actually the term if you are unknown whether you have the disease, self-isolation is, is when you have it. Right? So we'll go into quarantine. And <clears throat> we believe that um, if we continue in that region, it's very, very early days, yet we will be able to... Con this is a containment strategy. You cannot stop this disease, but we want to contain it to the extent that our health system and particularly our ICU beds can cope. Mm. We believe we can ramp that up to two or three times its current capacity relatively quickly. And the object is to keep the number of cases below the number of ICU beds that you need at any one moment. Mm. And we believe that we can do that. Mm. The eastern states, particularly Sydney and Melbourne, where, where most people enter the country, uh, are, are in a much, more, uh, much higher rate. Uh, but again, we see the numbers are plateauing mm. at the moment. Mm. So the, social, the, the isolation, the social distancing, the, uh, all the things that we're asking or enforcing the public to do seem to be working, but it's very, very early to talk about that yet. The, the second half of this crisis is the impact on, on our lives, but particularly the economy. Um, uh, you know, PwC, we're, we are impacted. Um, we're, we're taking measures, the hard measures on our people. 
um, uh, everyone is seeing this. I mean, there's a lot. There's a lot of people who are losing their business, losing their job. Um, seen record rates of unemployment uh, um, numbers in the U.S. overnight. Uh, um, we're seeing high, obviously high rates here. The government is doing a hell of a lot, an incredible amount. Again, you wouldn't have imagined this a month ago that we'd be able to do some of this stuff. How are you feeling about the South Australian economy? And have you even had the headspace yet to start to think about when the liftoff comes out of this, yeah. what do we do to, to, to come back and, and get our people back working, our businesses back on their feet? Yeah, look, I, I think... Um, we need to understand so th th there's a variation of impacts across the economy. So some businesses are doing much better than they would have done. And if you're a manufacturer of toilet rolls, you're probably in the best shape you've ever been in. Now, there may come a time that, that all of those toilet rolls have to be used up, in which case there may be a slump in your business. But right to the other end, hospitality events it, are effectively closed down. So how I like to characterise it is, Nobody's going to come through this unscarred. And those who are better off are duty-bound to help those who are worse off. Therefore, everybody has to put some part of their balance sheet into the equation to get us through, get us across the bridge, as Philip Lowe would say. And the government, the federal government, has put, you know, whatever it is now, $150, $200 billion worth of relief particularly the, the job keeper scheme, which is absolutely, you know, an absolutely magnificent effort. Mm -hmm. The states and territories have put about another 15 billion in. The, um, you know, people, if, if I'm, what's my, my personal balance sheet or my savings and things like my leave balances. Mm -hmm. So I might have to sacrifice part of that during this in order to help. With, I'm hardly affected at all other than not being able to go out of an evening mm -hmm. and sort of working like a one arm paper hanger. Mm -hmm. but, but that's the contribution that I can make other than, other than the work that, that we're doing. And I think all levels of government, all level, the private sector, the public sector, they all are going to have to make some contribution to get out the other side of this. We are very, very lucky in Australia. We have a very strong balance sheet. Mm. You, know, you would know from your previous job, our, our debt to equity ratio effectively, our debt to GDP ratio mm. is extremely low compared to the United Kingdom or most all of Europe, actually, mm. the United States, Japan, and so on. We're going to have to put some of that on the line mm. to get through the other side of this. Mm. And then we've got to figure out how do we grow? And depending on your economy, you know, if you look at big, big chunks of the economy are functioning as normal, mm -hmm. power, telecoms, uh, retail, uh, food retail, mm -hmm. farming, um, all the big sectors, uh, the big tourism obviously been hit very badly, services have been hit very badly, I suspect consulting has as well because it's to some extent discretionary expenditure yeah. and so on. Yeah. So I think, how do we make sure that whenever we start to light the blue touch paper at the other end, what do we need to get up quickly? What do we need to change? What, what was one of the, some of the reasons why some of these industries, some of them are vulnerable simply because they're people-to-people -people contact and so on, but some of them aren't. Yeah. So they've set up, there's been uh, there are two things. At a federal level, they've appointed a group called the National Coordination Commission, which is headed by Nev Power, the former chief executive of Fortescue, and has Greg Combe from the union side, and David Thode, and Paul Little, and all sorts of people on that, trying to think our way through how the private sector and the public sector is going to recover from this. On the state side, I've been appointed as the assistant state coordinator of recovery for COVID, and I'm going to do that and hopefully three work streams which we're just going to we're kind of just about to think stop running to stand still now so we're going to try and move forward a social work stream an economic work stream and an infrastructure work stream so how do we use how do we address those three sectors to keep us productive you know how do we keep people in good mental health when they're when they're when they're isolated either self or in very small units so that the the unintended health consequences of this don't don't wind up doing almost as much damage as the, you know, as the health consequences of this. How do we stimulate the economy with, with infrastructure build? Mm -hmm. How do we, um, what businesses are the most likely to pick up quickly? Mm -hmm. 
you know, is there a difference between small, a, a very small business and how quickly it can start up? I suspect they can start up quick, particularly if they've only been in hi hibernation. And you may see the Prime Minister using this term hibernation, which is what the job keeper payment is for. So the job keeper thing's got sort of two bits of genius to it. One, it, it, it keeps people, it gives people money at a time whenever they're either not earning as much as they were or nothing at all. And it gives them a sufficient amount of money, I suspect, to, to, be, to, be, to be able to live. Mm. But secondly, it keeps them in contact with their employer. Mm. It keeps the relationship between the employee and the employer. It's not paid through the welfare system, mm. which is under tremendous strain, mm. as you anyway. It was paid through the tax office and the employer, and that keeps that connection between the employee and the employer, so that when we cross the bridge, we're, we're at least in a better spot to kick yeah. off. It, it, turning to the public sector employee, is the, the change in the way that um, public servants work has been enormous in, in a, again, a very compressed period of time, the preparations to mm. you know, work, on, work at home en masse, um, you know, some private industry have probably taken a lot more steps in that, yeah. on that path and were more prepared to do it than possibly some of the public, public sector. How, from your perspective, has that experience been? It's very early to say. So we have had, so DPC, Department of Premier and Cabinet, we have about 500 people, I would guess, in DPC, doing mostly policy work, a bit of grant stuff and some other. I would say we have 80% of our people working from home on any given day. And that's really just possible due to technology. You know, you couldn't have done this 15 years ago. So Microsoft Teams and Zoom and and, and some encrypted stuff for cabinet and so on. Like, uh, and tele, all the national cabinet meetings are done by telepresence, you know, and they've worked extremely well. So it'll be interesting to see, and we'll need to start doing somehow measuring some stuff to say, how much productivity have we lost in certain areas? How much productivity have we gained in certain areas? So I've been running team meetings through Microsoft Teams, and this isn't a plug for Microsoft, but the discipline in running a Microsoft Teams meeting is so much better than having 20 blokes in a room and girls shouting at each other. You know, you actually have, you have to impose discipline on it because they can't all be on the screen at the same time. And you get, and I find it to have been a really great assistance to me in running particularly big meetings. So the public's, and you know, the other thing, we've got to balance this because there are people who have to go to work. There are people who are on the front line, you know, and the teachers and doctors and, and, and bus drivers and tram drivers and people who are, who are uh, in the supermarkets and, you know, and, uh, and, and service days and so on. Look, they, 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 they have to go to work. But, you know, the best way to stop spreading this disease is to stop or to slow it down, not to stop it, mm. is the fewest number of people moving around. Mm. Mm. This, this virus cannot move on its own. Mm. It can only move in a person. You stop the people, you stop the virus from moving. And, and that helps people who have to go to work because you're much less likely to get contagion with the, you know, the, the foot traffic and on you, uh, measured by mobile phone tracking in New South Wales and Victoria has gone in three weeks from 100% to 13%. Mm. Amazing. It is, now, it's not doing great things to the economy either, but, you know, nonetheless, it is, uh, uh, it's, uh, it's just amazing what, so, how socially cohesive Australians are when they have to be. So I've got some questions from um, people watching who have emailed in prior, so I'll just walk, work through these, Jim. Um, First one was, how do you suggest we support people with the ever-changing health recommendations? Yeah, well, look, people don't change the health recommendations for the hell of it. You know, the, the health recommendations, and the only health recommendations we take are from the HPPC, from the experts, the peak experts in the field, and they will change a bit. But actually, it's more by degree. So instead of 10 people who could gather, we recommend it's two. Insta you know... Uh, the self-isolation and quarantine, the time hasn't changed at all from the stars 14 days. So the best thing we can do is explain things really clearly and why we're doing it. And that's why the Premier particularly is very clear that any action he takes is proportionate 
and based upon health advice. Which we, but we need to be able, to, and in the first flurry, I suspect the communications weren't as clear as they might have been. Mm -hmm. We've got to be really clear with people. Mm -hmm. People, have, you know, pe people say, oh, there's a, a fair degree of, of, of um, acceptance that trust in government's not especially high in, in Australia in, 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 in normal times. We are asking people to trust us and do the things that, because can, we can't police every person. Mm -hmm. It's impossible to do that. So be clear. Give really good reasons for why why you're doing it, and then to a large extent, trust to the common sense and civic mindedness of the Australian public and the South Australian public. Second question, in part, you've you've addressed, um, but, but there might be other elements you want to add to. Um, what are the likely changes can we expect in the workplace for South Australian government agencies? Are we likely to be back to normal practices, or will there be a revolution? What do you envisage as the most significant change to eventuate for the SA public sector culture related to COVID-19 work conditions and experiences? Yeah, look, I don't, because this is a discontinuity, this is a disruption, this is like Uber entering the, the, the rideshare industry. No one expected it to happen and no one was quite sure what effect it was going to have. And I think we're in that position at the moment. I would certainly, out of every experience, good or bad, and by and large you learn more from bad experiences than from good experiences, we've got to learn some stuff from this. And if that's about how we work, and I'm sure it will be about how we work, then we'll need to take those lessons and, and implement them. Now, the fog, we're in the war, you know, in the fog of war, and you know, the first casualty of war is truth, and, and, and so all of that. But as we work our way through this, we've got to say, what worked, what was efficient, what did we learn from that, and particularly, is there anything that we can do in the way that we work, or the way that we live, or the way that we interact, that would help us contain such an event if it happened again? Mm -hmm. The third uh, question from uh, from the audience is, um, maybe this is one of your staff asking this, but what indicators and actions or characteristics show you that people working with you are star performers? Well, it's the same in a, it's the, it's the same, oh, not quite the same in an emergency area. So there's people who, who stay calm. You know, people, there is no point in panicking. You know, if a bad thing's going to happen, it doesn't matter if you're panicking or if you're calm, right? So it's much better to be calm because you think much more rationally then. So I like people who who, who have who are calm, who have a calm demeanour. But I also, it's the same. If someone says I'm going to do something, that to do it, yeah, and you don't have to chase them up to do it, and you know it's going to get done, and that saves your you know, effort and kind of in in pursuing chasing and in, in pursuing things. It's exactly the same characteristics that you would expect in a regular time with that added one of probably the more calm people are the more productive in in, uh, in but we need we need all sorts you know we need people with a million ideas even if you know 999,999 of them are rubbish but we know one of them might be really really good and might you know might solve something so yeah. so don't forget we have not yet solved the common cold we do not have a vaccine for the common cold. We will get a vaccine for this, but something else will come along that will test us, whether it be a big cyber attack or whatever. But pandemic is very scary because it affects everybody. You know, bushfires are very scary, but they affect directly a relatively few mm. number of people. Mm. This thing is so scary because it could affect you or me or our, your wife or your daughter or your, mm. your loved ones or your neighbour or whoever. Um, is there potential for the government, uh, the public sector, to provide more equipment to enable more working from home? Uh, many could be much more efficient from home with laptops and VPNs. Yeah, look, VP, VP, uh, more VPNs wouldn't necessarily solve the problem because you've got a, there's only so many can be on at a given time. But, you know, again, this is something we will learn out of this. Who are the people who really need VPNs to do their work? I had a VPN. I don't need a VPN. I have an AA who has a VPN, and that's all I need is to be able to communicate with her. So we've got to learn from this. How do we distribute? And it's not on a it's not on a seniority basis. Who should have access to this technology or that or that technology? But yes, I think would would have been really really unusual if we had had a perfect response for this. Just yes. sitting waiting. So yes, some of those things are valid. Yeah. Mm.
the fifth question, should we have begin to have a focus on uh, the epidemiology of COVID-19, e.g. targeting <coughs> immune compromised and 60 pluses in the first wave of staff to work from home? Yeah, and we did. And that's the, the message I put out to chief executives whenever we were talking, is make sure you look at your age group and those who are in, you know, and I was kind of fit into some of this category as well, certainly those who are immunocompromised, those who have a comorbidity, and those who are in the upper age group should be, the, you know, unless they're doing something that really they have to come into work for, they should, be, they should, they should go home. Um, and the last question from the, from the group is, what is one leadership tool, model or mantra that you use that helps you through times like this? think really good leaders, and, I, and I'm not including myself in this, although I share this character, this is the argument with the missing middle, really good leaders are optimistic, right? And I'm optimistic. That's not the same as saying if you're optimistic, you're a good leader, which is why it's an argument with the missing middle. It's a, it's a false syllogism. But, you know, optimism is a great thing. And if we believe it's different than voluntarism, if, so voluntarism is where you believe that you're going to achieve something despite the objective obstructions in it, like the Great Leap Forward for the Chinese. Mm -hmm. But this, op this great optimism that a young country, old for its original, uh, its, our, our indigenous people, but a relatively young country in terms of its federation, the optimism that we have, I think, is probably the greatest attribute that, that leaders should be bringing out in people as we move through this. Mm -hmm. And we will get to the other side of it. And, you know, in three or four or five years' time, I will probably think this was a very exciting time, which is not exactly how I feel at the moment. <laughs> and to finish, give us the optimistic Jim McDowell, 2AM conversation with himself. What... What do we expect in the next few months? What is oh, no, I think I think you expect a bit more of the same. I think we're going to have to just kind of. This isn't the this all the all the commentators who were saying lock everyone down. No one can explain what lockdown is, by the way. Lock everyone down for a month and then it'll all be all right. This just isn't going to happen. This is going to be get it under control, all right? Sustain. How long can we sustain this for? When can we start to release? What's a gradual path before we can really lift off? We're going to have to think our way and work our way through all of that. And in order to do that, we'll have to bring the vast majority of people along with us. And, you know, my, I used to, th I, every Wednesday at 5.30, I go to the, uh, the Lion Hotel and have wings with my son. Right? He's 14. And whenever I'm able to do that again, that very simple thing will mean we've come through this. Mm. Thank you, Jim.